हेलो स्टूडेंट्स आफ्टर कंप्लीटिंग द क्लासिफिकेशन एंड पॉसिबल टारगेट साइड्स ऑफ एंटी डायबिटिक एजेंट्स ओवरऑल एंटी डायबिटिक एजेंट्स नाउ वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट द फर्स्ट ड्रग ग्रुप दैट इज सल्फोनाइल यूरियाज एंड द लर्निंग ऑब्जेक्टिव्स ऑफ टूडेज सेशन आर students should enlist the sulfonyl ureas and should know the difference between first and second generation agents should know the mechanism of action and the pharmacological actions of sulfonyl ureas pharmacokinetic characteristics therapeutic uses as well as the therapeutic status in diabetes mellitus adverse effects and limitations of sulfonyl urea and dosage regime now first sulfonyl ureas they are classified into the two generations first generation and second generation in some sources it is no uh, they have been classified as first second and third generation but these differences in the generation are according to their discovery first generation compounds are tolbutamide and in the second generation glipizide glicleside glibenclamide and glimepiride now except the time of the discovery which are the other differences between first and second generation second generations they are more potent clinically more superior as compared to the first generation compounds and there were other first generation compounds but they are not used now because of their longer duration of action and chances of hypoglycemia and that's why only the tolbutamide of the first generation is available okay right? now the mechanism of action now here you consider this is a pancreatic beta cell and this is the cell membrane inside the pancreatic beta cell there are insulin containing granules are present and on this cell membrane sulfonyl urea receptors here you can see the sulfonyl urea receptors are present on the cell membrane and these receptors they are incorporated atp sensitive potassium channels and when this channel is open potassium ions moves out of the pancreatic beta cells but when the sulfonyl urea binds with this receptor this atp sensitive potassium channel closes and because of this the outward movement of potassium from the beta cell reduces this will lead to intracellular accumulation of the potassium that leads to depolarization and because of this depolarization there is an another membrane bound calcium channel which opens and there is a tremendous increase in the intracellular availability of calcium now what this calcium will do this calcium it will do the movement and fusion of the insulin vesicles to the Uh, beta cell membrane and exocytotic release of insulin so again to revise sulfonyl urea binds with the sulfonyl urea receptor that are present on the pancreatic beta cell membrane these receptor are at uh, the incorporated atp sensitive potassium channel when the sulfonyl urea binds with the receptor this channel closes and that's why the exit of the potassium from the pancreatic beta cell reduces this increases the potassium and this will lead to the depolarization which triggers calcium uh, release uh, sorry which opens the calcium channel and increased availability of calcium inside the cell that will lead to the fusion of the vesicles to the beta cell membrane and exocytotic release of insulin so in nutshell 
the sulfonyl ureas they act by increases the insulin release and that's why they are also known as a insulin secretor go now so the principal pharmacological action is they increases the insulin secretion but but this point is very important at any glucose level in the plasma and this is the reason that even if even if the plasma glucose level is normal or it is even low if you administer the sulfonylurea it will causes release of the insulin and the chances of the hypoglycemia will be there so if you give sulfonylurea in diabetic individual it releases the insulin and reduces the blood sugar and may help to reach to the target level but if you introduce the sulfonylurea into a normal healthy individual still it will stimulate the pancreatic beta cell releases the insulin and hypoglycemia will be there and that's why the biggest limitation of the sulfonylurea is hypoglycemia second you will uh, encounter two terminologies while discussion one is the hypoglycemic drug and second is the anti diabetic drug don't confuse with this two term anti diabetic drugs means drugs that are useful in the treatment of diabetes by reducing the blood sugar level in diabetic individuals only while the hypoglycemic drug means they just reduces the blood sugar whether a person is diabetic or a person is a normal healthy uh, human volunteer or the person is already having hypoglycemia so we can say that sulfonylurea is an hypoglycemic drug okay now the another thing is that you have learned in the physiology that there are different phases of the insulin secretion especially after the meal and sulfonylureas that primarily affect the second phase of the insulin secretion and these agents are having no effect on the first phase of the insulin release and that's why that's why because of the second uh, their effect on the second phase of the insulin secretion again it is not going to be very much helpful to control the postprandial hyperglycemia but at the same time the chances of interdigestive hypoglycemia will be more but but sulfonylureas act on pancreatic beta cells and they stimulate them now this stimulation can only be possible if the beta cells are functionally present and that's why functioning pancreatic beta cells are essential for the action of sulfonylurea and hence sulfonylurea are not effective in case of a absolute insulin deficiency which is present in case of the destruction of the pancreatic beta cells in case of type 1 diabetes and that's why sulfonylurea are effective only in type 2 diabetes now pharmacokinetic characteristics they are well absorbed orally very tightly bound to the plasma proteins and that's why volume of distribution is low primarily metabolized in the liver and some of the metabolites are active also but finally eliminated through the kidney and because of this the primarily metabolism in the liver and the excretion in the kidney cosious use cosious use must be there in case of hepatic and renal failure and another clinically uh, important thing is that if the person is having hepatic or renal ma uh, marginal uh, infunction in these cases also the chances of the hypoglycemia will be more now we discuss about the adverse effect as we are discussing the adverse effect of the sulfonylurea from the first slide and that is hypoglycemia okay and this is lowest with the tolbutamide because it's uh, uh, we can say that the efficacy is less and it is having a very shorter duration of 
exon. So the lowest risk with tolbutamide. The second is, as you all know, that insulin is an anabolic hormone, and as the sulfonylurea stimulates the pancreatic beta cells and releases the insulin, the weight gain of around 1 to 4 kg will be there in case of sulfonylureas. And as the name suggests, sulfonylurea is a sulfa drug, and that's why the allergic reactions, rashes, photosensitivity, are common, and sometimes, sometimes, uh, serious allergic reactions like angioedema or agranulocytosis will be there. Now the dosage regime. You should know the doses of two to three commonly used drugs, and that is the most commonly used drug is glipizide. Starts with the five milligram, and it increases up to the twenty milligram. It is usually given once or twice daily. Same with glibenclamide, two point five to fifteen milligram daily, and glimepiride, one to six milligram daily. All these drugs are given in one or two divided doses. Now the last, which is very important, is therapeutic status in the diabetes. As we have discussed, these drugs are effective only in type two diabetes. They are not effective in type one diabetes, and again in type two diabetes. Previously. Uh, sulfonylureas were considered to be the drug of choice. It means that if the person is newly detected type 2 diabetic case, then the sulfonylureas are considered to be the first choice of the drug. But now they are not considered as a drug of choice and their status is inferior to that of metformin. It means if the person is not responsive to the maximum dose of the metformin, then one can add on or switch over to the sulfonylurea. Now, what is the reason behind that? The reason lies in the natural uh, progression of the type 2 diabetes and the mechanism of action of sulfonylureas. Now, what is the natural progression of type 2 diabetes? There is, there is in type 2 diabetes, there is an insulin resistance and that's why the functioning insulin is not there and that's why the signal goes to the pancreas and pancreas will be stimulated and there is a more insulin release and that's why the majority of the type 2 diabetic patients especially the Asian type 2 diabetic patients they are hyperinsulinemic so in the plasma level the insulin level is normal and many a times it is higher but there is an insulin resistance and as the more and more pancreatic beta cells are stimulated, they are exhausted and finally there is an absolute deficiency of insulin. In, in, uh, in terms of now there is a no active functioning pancreatic beta cells. Now what the sulfonylureas are doing? They are doing the same thing. They stimulate the pancreatic beta cells. Those surviving pancreatic beta cells this stimulates the pancreatic beta cells and they foster the progression or they foster the exhaustion of pancreatic beta cells. And dear friends, as I told you in the first slide of the diabetes that it is a metabolic disorder. It affects all the metabolism, carbohydrate, protein and fat metabolism. Okay. Sulfonylureas are not going to affect any other metabolic parameters in the diabetes and they are not going to be improve the insulin sensitivity and all these advantages are there in the metformin and that's why sulfonylureas they are not considered as a drug of choice the reason is as i told you they exhaust the pancreatic beta cells and foster the progression of disease now the another insulin secretagogues i'm discussing over here because there are more similarities between the sulfonylureas and maglutinides first and foremost the agents maglutinides are repaglinide and nateglinide now their similarity with the sulfonylureas is they are also insulin secretagogues they 
act on the same receptors uh, which are present onto the pancreatic beta cell membrane they act on the same way they act once they combine with their receptor there is a closure of ATP sensitive potassium channel which increases the intracellular potassium depolarization opening of the calcium channel exocytotic release of the insulin then what are the differences similar mechanism of action on the same receptor the difference is there is a quick association and dissociation kinetics it means that the magnetinides binding with the receptor and dissociation from the receptor is very quick and that's why it is having a rapid onset of action and shorter duration of action because of this pharmacodynamic characteristic as well as the pharmacokinetic characteristic kinetic characteristic means they are having a very quick oral absorption and very rapid metabolism and that is lead to a very rapid onset of the action and shorter duration of the action and they are effective to augment the first phase as contrary to the sulfonylurea they are effective to augment the second phase while here the magnetinides they are effective to augment the first phase of insulin release so based on these characteristics you just think that so if you carefully look at the pharmacological profile of magnetinides because of their quick onset and short duration of action they are not effective in controlling the 24 hour blood sugar level but they are very effective to control the blood sugar for a short period of time and where it is required it is required in a case where otherwise the blood sugar is well controlled but there is a problem only for the controlling the postprandial hyperglycemia or mild related hyperglycemia and the biggest advantage of the magnetinide is that because of its very rapid onset of action it can be taken just before the meal so the advantage is that suppose if for any reason the patient has missed the meal patient can miss the dose of the drug also and that's why the therapeutic status of these agents is they are used as an adjuvant to the other agents for controlling the postprandial hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetic patients now in the next class we will discuss about the incretin based therapy for the incretin mimetic agents which mimics the release of the incretins dear friends you know that incretins are the gut hormones which are released in response to the <coughs> meal because of the rise in the blood sugar level and they stimulate the pancreatic beta cells and they cause the release of the insulin apart from many other actions and the two agents in this group and these are dpp4 inhibitors this is dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors and glucagon like peptide 1 glp1 analogs these we will discuss in our next session and these incretin based therapies are in addition to the stimulation of the insulin release they are having many other actions which are helpful in type 2 diabetes and now they are getting a promising status in the management of type 2 diabetes that we will discuss in our next class and if yet you have not subscribed this channel that is pharmacology in simplified way by dr darshan dave please subscribe it keep sharing and keep learning thanks a lot